I'd like to introduce Jennifer Spear, who is a historian at uh, Simon Fraser University and uh, a dear colleague. So, thank you. Welcome Thanks to all of you. Uh, welcome to this evening's lecture. It is my great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Professor Jonathan Lamb. Um, a couple of hours ago, as I was preparing these comments, I was sitting on the, the western bank of the peninsula here, watching the, the sun drop down the sun behind into the Pacific Ocean, behind Vancouver Island, where James Cook had landed in 1778, on early on his third and what would ultimately be his final voyage. Among his crew was a young George Vancouver, who later came back to this region and after whom the island and the city are named. Um, I was thinking then not so much of the objects that have been so much discussed at, at previous panels yesterday and today, but the other concept that informs this symposium, and that is the itineraries um, and the global encounters that they engender. I was thinking of Captain Cook voyages across the Atlantic, of Professor Lamb's own Pacific journeys, and eventually of my own as well. I'm going to be indulgent and tell you about my own. First, before I tell you about Professor Mayers. Uh, one of my very earliest memories comes from the beginning of my own Pacific voyages. Uh, when I was five years old, my family moved from Madison, Wisconsin to hey. Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> um, in those days, even by flight, that voyage had to take several legs. You couldn't fly directly from, from California. Uh, to Australia. So we stopped in uh, California, in Hawaii, uh, and Fiji, where we stayed for a week before heading to our new life in Australia. My memory is of an early morning swim at the hotel pool with the All Blacks rugby team, who just happened to be staying there at the same time. This very early global encounter in my own life involved the descendant of English colonizers of New England. I go back to the, the Pilgrims, Mayflower. Um, and the descendants of mostly English colonizers of New Zealand, who had just been trounced by the Fijian barbarians, and indeed that is the rugby team's name of Fiji. Um, sometimes, indeed, the empire does strike back. Professor Lamb has had his own Pacific itinerary and global encounters, educated in England at the University of York. He transversed the globe in 1969, to the University of Auckland, where he would teach for 25 years. In 1995, he traveled eastward across the Pacific. I'm sure he had done so before, but it certainly completes his, his global, uh, almost global uh, passage, um, across the Pacific to the United States, first to teach at Princeton, and since 2002 at Vanderbilt, where he is the Andrew, w. Mel Andrew M. Mellon Professor of Humanities. He has held fellowships at the Huntington Library, uh, Clare Hall in Cambridge, the, Amer the ACLS, the Humanities Research Center in Canberra, among many, many others. Professor Lamb's itinerary has been reflected in his scholarship as well. After publishing books on the English novel uh, Lawrence Stern and the 18th century British readings of the Book of Job, he too ventured into the South Seas. He has published many articles and book chapters on subjects ranging from, and these are, these are uh, titles of various publications, A Sublime Moment of Poverty Bay, to Ballads of the Scurvy. He has edited a collection of British and American narratives of uh, Pacific voyages, an anthology, as well as a special issue of the 18th century, uh, of 18th century life on South Pacific narratives and myths. In 2001, he published the prize winning Preserving the Self in the South Seas, 1680 to 1840, with the University of Chicago Press. In Preserving the Self, Professor Lamb argues that European voyagers in the South Seas were an anxious, ambivalent, and fearful lot, a far cry from their usual depictions as intrepid explorers. Lamb himself, I think, has been a fairly intrepid explorer, however, in daringly voyaging into the territory of, of Captain Cook, which has been so dominated by the debate between Marshall Sands and Gannett Obisigieri um, in their debate over the causes of his death. Um, uh, Professor Lamb has argued that Cook may indeed have been suffering from vitamin deficiencies that may have caused him to behave in unstable <coughs> and erratic ways that led to his death. Um, he is here tonight to talk to us about his current manuscripts, The Things That Things Say, um, and about the metamorphosis of Captain Cook. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lamb back to the Pacific. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. That's very kind. And thank you, Neil, for the water and for the invitation. <laughs> uh, it's a great honor. Um, as Jennifer said, I, what I want to do is talk to you um, 
tonight um, about um, a, a chapter in this book, The Things Things Say. Um, and I, very briefly, the strategy of this book is to examine the difference between uh, persons and authors and objects and things. And those are necessarily very sort of compressed categories. So let me just fill them out a little bit. I take the definition of person from Hobbes and Locke so that a person is an actor, uh, a, a, a factitious unity, um, a forensic figure always performing in the public eye, um, authorized to speak and act by other persons who are in turn authorized by persons. So a person sits at the center of a vast exchange of power, property, money, and narrative, um, a representation amidst rep representations. An author, on the other hand, uh, this, the, the author, author is a name given by Hobbes um, to the individual in a state of nature endowed with natural rights but with no security. Uh, my author is pretty similar. My author sits at the edge of, um, of, of civility, uh, not sure whom to trust or what to say and what to keep secret. Uh, and if we were looking for examples of persons and authors in fiction, early fiction of the 18th century, you'd find that Robinson Crusoe is a person, uh, whereas Defoe's Roxana is an author. Things, things, unlike objects, um, are solitary, often immobile, inclined to commune only with themselves. Um, the thing, Roxana says, spoke itself. The things that Robinson Crusoe finds washed up on the shore of his island, the three hats, the one cap, and the two shoes that don't match, um, they speak themselves. Um, and one of the things they say is that they will never again be objects. Between author and things subsists a spontaneous uh, and passionate sympathy which carries them below or above the levels of civil exchange so that they appear like beasts or like idols or like gods. And these are terms that I'm going to elaborate now, so I'm not being too... Uh, gnomic, I hope. Um, so I want to tell you how Captain Cook changed from a person into an author and from an author into a god when he discovered that some objects are really things. And I should apologize here for um, returning to this threadbare tale of Captain Cook's death, uh, but it is the fact of its being threadbare uh, and the fact that it is so often repeated that actually interests me and in which I want to partly talk about tonight. During his first visit to Tahiti, Cook did something uncharacteristic. He gave a doll to Purea, the important, um, the important woman in Matavai Bay. He said, to Oba, Obaraya, for such is this woman's name, I gave several things, but what seemed to please her most was a child's doll, which I made her understand was the picta, the picta of my wife. As soon as we came ashore, she fastened it to her breast, um, took me in her hand and dragged me first this way, then that. Uh, the people all the while crowding about us to get a sight of the doll. What is even more surprising than this trivial gesture of a famous mariner is the white lie that goes with it, uh, that this figure stands for someone else, for Mrs. Cook. It's so unlike the commitment to the literal that we associate with Cook's accounts of his voyages. I want to argue that there's a, a, a link between Cook's fleeting and surreptitious interest here in doll making and the events leading to his death. But first I want to establish what is at stake when a commitment to the literal account of objects is infiltrated by things which are made to stand like idols, as St. Paul says, for nothing. There was no community more committed to the united priorities of property and narrative uh, 
than the lords of the Admiralty who sent Cook three times into the South Seas. They believed in the inviolability of the king's property and they believed that the experience of its being held and used by the king's commissioned officers could be owned exactly in a public narrative. You are, by all opportunities, they wrote to Cook, to send to our secretary for our information accounts of your proceedings and copies of the surveys and drawings you shall have made. Upon your arrival in England, you are immediately to repair to this office in order to lay before us a full account of your proceedings in the whole course of your voyage taken care before you leave the sloop to demand from the officers and petty officers the log books and journals they, that they, they may have kept and to seal them up for our inspection. Those were his orders. And it's precisely as uh, a man obedient to such orders to give an account, being the chief one here, it's exactly as that that Cook conceived himself. He said, the public must not expect from me the elegance of a fine writer or the plausibility of a professed bookmaker, but will, I hope, consider me as a plain man zealously exerting himself in the service of his country and determined to give the best account he is able of his proceedings. So he puts himself before the public as a literate person, then distinctly not as an author. Property of the Crown was supplied to the ship by warrant from the Navy Board via several other boards or agencies. Med medicines and surgical items came from the Sick and Hurt Board. Cordage, sails and spars through the office of the shipyard, which in this case was Deptford. Guns and ammunition from the Ordnance Office, food and liquor through the Victualling Board. The commander was responsible for a proper audit of all this material. And Cook never had a purser on his ship, so he had to do it all himself. So the surgeons, gunners, cooks and carpenters prepared accounts of stores expended, countersigned by the commander. But there were over 60 accounts uh, that had to be accepted by the Navy board before a captain was paid off. Um, in the endeavour and resolution, Cook carried along with all these other naval stores, scientific equipment and a battery of anti-school boutique remedies together with trade goods and trinkets destined to be exchanged for supplies and goodwill. And he had on board also the seeds of fruits and vegetables and breeding pairs of domestic animals and fowls intended to supply the islands of the Pacific and ultimately their visitors with a rich source of food in the years to come. And these gifts he offered on behalf of King George III, who took a great interest in these voyages. And Nicholas Thomas has argued that Cook identified powerfully with this act of royal benevolence and felt his reputation depended on the successful acclimatization of these species. That's to say, he took his role as the king's deputy or person very seriously. Sadly for Cook, there was no more perilous testing ground of the dual function of property and narrative than the South Seas. The first European landing on an inhabited island in the Pacific uh, was made in pursuit of stolen property. That was Magellan in 1521. From his first arrival in Tahiti, Cook was incessantly aware of the danger to objects. He reported, the natives flocked around us in great numbers and in as friendly a manner as we could wish, only that they showed a great inclination to pick our pockets. Within a few minutes, a snuff box and a telescope had disappeared, and these were followed some days later by the loss of an iron rake, a musket, a pair of pistols belonging to Joseph Banks, and worst of all, the new quadrant made especially by Mr. Bird for the measurement of the transit of Venus. Nails, ironwork, books, clothing, weapons, boys, boats, and animals all fell a victim to ingenious robberies committed by Polynesians which they then triumphantly reenacted to the huge amusement of the local people. <laughs> William Anderson wrote, the only crime we know they have, uh, is a uh, have a propensity to is theft to which all sexes and ages are addicted in an uncommon degree. It seems to arise solely from an intense curiosity, he said, or desire to possess something which they see belongs to a sort of people so different from themselves that if it were possible, a set of beings seeming as superior in our judgment should appear amongst us, 
I doubt whether our natural regard to justice would be able to restrain many from falling into the same error. Uh, an interesting, and it turns out, proleptic remark. Whatever the motive for these thefts, Cook decided from the start to treat lean, lean, leniently the purloining of private property, but to make every effort to retrieve things belonging to the Crown, seizing canoes or taking hostages until the missing things were returned. In Tonga, Paulaho, uh, senior chief, was taken uh, hostage until a turkey was given back. Poea Tua, the uh, beautiful daughter of a Rayatian chief, uh, was taken hostage until two deserters were returned. Um, Cook was trying to take prisoner the paramount Hawaiian chief Kalani Puhu, uh, when, um, uh, in order to regain the discovery's cutter, which had gone missing, when he was knocked down and killed. Private property was less concerned about. Banks's waistcoat uh, and pistols, Dr. Monkhouse's snuffbox, Lieutenant Williamson's fancy gun, and even Cook's own stockings, uh, were stolen without fuss, but anything marked with the broad arrow of the crown, as literally, uh, literally the cutter was and effectually the turkey was, required the utmost uh, exertion to secure. Accordingly, ship stores uh, and equipment were defended by Cook, sometimes savagely. No matter how curious he was about local customs, Cook's anthropology was mortgaged to this stark difference between royal Mayum and Polynesian Tuum. And given the multitude of things, both present and absent, still in store or already lost or used, for which he was accountable, it was perhaps excusable in Cook to be so agitated by their unexplained disappearance. After all, these were as much the material of his narrative uh, the narrative of the voyage as the discovery of new lands and the taking possession of them. They were a very important part of the account. But it's worth noting just how agitated Cook could get. James Trevenon recalled how he once angered his captain. Of course, I had a haver, haver being a Maori um, stamping dance, of the old boy, violent motions and stampings on the deck, paroxysms of passion into which he often threw himself upon the slightest occasion. That was Trevenon's report. And even David Samuel, who wrote an account of Cook's death to acquit him of the charge of imprudence, um, was forced to admit that he had a hasty temper. In his last days, the, the crew thought him um, possessed, exhibiting, uh, as they put it, a degree of infatuation which rendered him deaf to everything, and infatuation altogether unaccountable. And it's long been a reproach to Cook's reputation that his reactions to the theft of naval equipment became increasingly bizarre. The man who stole the turkey for which the Tongan chief Paulaho was taken hostage was punished by having his arms sliced to the bone. Uh, on Huahine, the man who took the sextant had his hair and ears cropped. On Mooria, uh, Cook destroyed great numbers of houses and canoes in reprisal for the theft of a goat. Uh, in his unofficial account of the voyage, John Rickman reported that two hostages taken at Mo'orie apparently were being prepared for a hideous death. Large ropes, he said, were carried upon the main deck and made fast fore and aft. Axes, chains, and instruments of torture were placed upon the quarter deck in the sight of the young men. I mean, nothing actually took, took place, but something was being prepared, if only to terrify them. Now, this contentious issue of Cook's, of Cook's cruelty has not gone away. Uh, in the latest reassessments of his career, it's been necessary to revisit the question of what Beagle Hole called inner tiredness. Um, and Salmon chooses to explain this. Uh, Nicholas Thomas more or less sets it aside. I mean, she traces the origin of, of Cook's cruelties to the Grass Cove massacre, or rather to his refusal to avenge it. At Grass Cove in New Zealand's Queen Charlotte Sound, the crew of the Adventures Cutter was slain, jointed, uh, cooked, and partly eaten, although there is no, there is no witness of that, um, except a fictional one called Hildebrand Bowman, actually. Um, on his third voyage, Cook entertained the perpetrator, the alleged perpetrator of this massacre, Kahura, uh, on board the Resolution, and inspired the contempt of the Maori for not taking revenge, uh, 
and the earning the reproaches of his own crew for not executing the murderer. Um, and Salmond argues that this, this isolated him. I mean, he didn't, he, did, he didn't have friends among the crew, he didn't have friends among the Maori, uh, and he became kind of lonely uh, and morbid and finally barbarous. Um, and certainly, I mean, along with all the cruelties he, he exercised uh, against thieves, he began to flog his own men at twice the rate of previous voyages. Nicholas Thomas uh, mentions Cook's failure to explore Fiji, Bora Bora, uh, or Samoa by way of suggesting a set of priorities that emerged from Cook's conception of himself as guardian of public property and the person of the king. At Nui, Nui uh, and Vanuatu, for example, Cook encountered hostile populations that he had no inclination to soften or civilize and about which he felt no curiosity whatsoever. Uh, he was principally concerned with those islands of the Tahitian, Tongan, New Zealand and uh, Hawaiian groups whose cultures, cultures had evolved rituals and customs that he found interesting and which he wanted to understand. And he wanted to understand them because he felt he had something to offer that would benefit them considerably. The subsequent extravagance of Cook's behaviour, for instance, his wholesale destructions of houses and canoes at Moorea, in an effort to recover a single, very small goat, uh, is intelligible, Thomas suggests, only if we consider the vastness of Cook's enterprise from his own point of view. He was aiming to solve the problem of the lack of, of food, lack of property, uh, in the South Seas. The theft of breeding pairs was particularly irritating to him because they were crimes that would perpetuate the privation in which lay the temptation to commit more crimes. Um, any impediment to the royal scheme of benevolence was to be removed with maximum force. This, this, is, this is Nick's argument. But naval property had to be protected too as part of the account. Thus it was that Cook perished after two days spent in pursuit of items that had gone missing on the beach, the armourer's tongs, the lid of the water cask, a chisel, a midshipman's cap, bits of the discovery's pinnace, and all of her cutter. I mean, it begins to sound a bit like those three caps, one hat, and two, two shoes that were not fellows on the beach of Crusoe's Island. Various pictures have been given of Cook on the day before his death, making wild and undignified traverses of the beach in pursuit of the tongs and the chisel, very much like Robinson Crusoe in his first frenzy on the, on the shore after he's been cast up. The question raised by such extravagance is whether Cook did in fact retain some weird fidelity to his mission or whether his relation to objects and the duty of accounting for them had changed. And on this topic, Glenn Williams has shed a very interesting light recently. Um, when he um, brings to our attention the fact that Cook appears either deliberately to have stopped writing his account or to have written such a strange uh, or scandalous one that his editor, John Douglas, was induced with strong encouragement from the Admiralty, it would seem, to destroy the evidence and to rewrite the narrative of the circumstances surrounding his death. Uh, Williams points out that Cook's holograph journal ends on the 6th of January, 1779, two-thirds down the page, uh, while Cook was still at sea, more than a week away from the landing at Keala Kekua Bay. His holograph log ends on the 17th of January, three quarters of the way down the page and midway through the first day's events on the beach at Keala Kekwa, which include the ceremony where he was wrapped in a red cloak and worshipped as Lono, the god. Cook merely records that he was taken to the Heiau or Marai of, of Hikiau, Hikiau, sorry, but no more than that. He, he doesn't record anything more. Assuming that Cook kept a daily log but wrote up the journal intermittently, the missing pages of the log are the chief enigma. We're left to assume either that Cook, neglecting one of the most cardinal rules of the service, is to make a daily entry in the log, chose to stop making entries the day after his first taste of divinity, or that he kept it on separate leaves which no longer exist. <laughs> 
In any event, it's certain that there are now no traces of Cook's own first-hand impressions in his own hand from the 18th of January until the day of his death, the 14th of February. The question Williams is trying to answer really does for both of his alternatives. What was it Cook wrote which justified censorship? Or what was it he didn't write which explains his silence? Either way, Cook laid down his pen as person of George III, a commissioned officer, and chose instead to act as an author. Instead of property, he started guarding things. And let me here insert two fables about the subversion of, a, of, of an accountable relation to maritime property. In Richard Hughes's pirate story, A High Wind in Jamaica, questions of narrative order and property become tangled up in the mysterious death of a ship's captain. In this strangely incoherent tale of a group of children on the Spanish main, we find the linked difficulties of owning things and giving the story of them dramatized in a context of general theft as ships are seized, the holds, their holds rifled, and things and people changed, as the children put it. Two of them, Rachel and Emily, are dimly aware that the integrity of property is important and they are standing by to own the truth of owning things. So Rachel collects oakum, mopheads, mar marlin spikes and bits of rag, calls them her own babies and houses them in various parts of the ship. As for her older sister, Emily, she simulates the owning of things, owning of things in the sense of narrative, by letting loose strings of words, a sort of narrative noise, the narrator calls it, as if she were preparing herself for the arrival of real narrative substance. Neither she nor her sister succeeds in owning anything, however, for things keep getting lost or escaping in a manner that is not, at least from their point of view, ownable or accountable. The marlin spike falls out of Rachel's grasp while she's uh, nursing it as a baby in the rigging, uh, and it wounds Emily in the leg. While Emily is recovering, a knife comes into her hand, hands which stabs and kills a tied-up Dutch skipper, an event which no public narrative in this novel is destined ever to frame. There's no ownership of these things, the marlin spike and the knife, and in their self-activity as babies, they prove dangerous and even fatal to the human beings who come within their ambit. The narrator says of Rachel's collection of babies, to parody Hobbes, she claimed as her own whatever she had mixed her imagination with, and the greater part of her time was spent in angry or tearful assertions of her property rights. It's not Hobbes, of course, but Locke who makes this claim for property, obtained not by the imagination but by labour, saying whatsoever a man removes out of the state that nature hath provided and left it in, he hath mixed his labour with and joined to it something that is his own and thereby makes it his property. Hobbes, however, acknowledges the enormous power of imagination over things, especially images and idols, or what Rachel would call babies. When he says, and whereas a man can fancy shapes he never saw, making up a figure out of the parts of divers creatures, as the poets make their centaurs, chimerae, and other monsters never seen, so can he also give matter to those shapes and make them in wood, clay, or metal. And these are also called images, not for the resemblance of any corporeal thing, but for the resemblance of some fantastical inhabitants of the brain of the maker. Although Hobbes and Locke differ um, about the origin of property and how it is kept, they do agree about the close and necessary relation between owning things in the sense of possessing them and owning them in the sense of giving an account of them. It's evident from the way Hughes frames Rachel's and Emily's attitudes to things that this sort of property and this sort of nar narrative integrity is what they desire, but not possessing them, they're left with babies that strongly resemble 
Hobbes's images and idols and the doll that Cook gave to Pourer. Um, I'm just putting this here because this is my object, uh, and I'm going to come to it <laughs> soon. Um, in Mardi, that strange fantasia on the theme of Polynesia, Melville describes the habits of Anatu, a woman so addicted to theft she cannot resist stealing equipment from the wretched craft on which she is stranded, the sinking boat, but still she steals. She raids it for booty, which, for which, which has no other, she has no other, other means of securing than in the ship itself. She's a sort of Robinson Crusoe with a wreck but no island. In a bizarre attempt to find a means of stowage independent of the hull, she steals the log line and tows a box behind the vessel filled with knives and axe blades. And these are Anatu's small babies for whom she finds, for whom she finds uh, uh, houses, you know, just like Rachel. But unlike Rachel, and very like the Polynesians mentioned by Cook and Anderson, she has no attachment at all to the idea of property defined by Hobbes and Locke. Already, these redistributed artefacts are, in Anatu's mind and imagination, idols, hers by virtue of the force of imagination. They are, for her, the lares and the penates of a foundering vessel. She is an author and they are things. Well, the anthropologist, anthropologist Alfred Jell, who's already been cited today, points out, children do not play with dolls, but actually make a cult of them, or worship them. They are not at play, but at work. They are serious. As for the products of such labor, he mentions two potent examples from the South Sea. And one is ah 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 from uh, Rurutu, um, who's now housed in the British Museum, a survivor of uh, the iconoclasm of uh, South Sea's missionaries. Um, and it is an absolutely remarkable um, figure. Um, um, I mean, Gell calls it a fractal god. I mean, because, you know, the, the, main, the main figure is, is, is pullulating images of himself all over his skin. Uh, as Gell says, the surface of the idol consists of am amalgamated replications of itself, a succession of budding protuberances, and each is identical with that from which it protrudes. Um, Empson, William Empson, wrote a poem about it. Um, it's... it's um, it's, it, the first stanza goes like this. There is a supreme god in the ethnological section of the British Museum. He means there is a supreme god in the ethnological section, a hollow toad shape. It's the front, the back, and then with the back off. Um, A hollow toad shape faced with a blank shield. He needs his belly to include the pantheon, which is inserted in a hole behind. At the navel, at all the points formerly stressed, at the organs of sense, lice glue themselves, dolls, local deities. His smooth wood creeps with all the creeds of the world. Um, I, I, I mean, it seems to me that... that, that, that if you are looking for a picture of a personification, uh, remember that a personification, um, as Stephen Knapp puts it, puts it he, a personification knows itself with a purity of consciousness uh, unknown to the empirical mind uh, because, um, because, because a personification is what it does. I mean, that God makes itself again and again. I mean, that God sort of figures what God says, Jehovah says to Moses, I am that I am. Anyhow, um, the, 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 that's Aha, that's, uh -huh. um, but, but Jell also mentions To'o, uh, which is a, a, a genre of Tahitian gods. Um, Idols made of wood and senate that refer only, uh, according to Gell, I'm relying on him here entirely, only to the 
potentiality of form. They are the pillars of the sky before they've become the pillars of the sky. So they don't actually represent anything yet because what they represent does not yet exist. So the Toho subsists in a state prior to the creation of the earth and sky. He says the Toho are wholly iconic and wholly aniconic at the same time. Having already offered Oberea an idol that referred to Mrs. Cook but did not represent her, Cook was alive to these issues and about to become more so when he attended the installation festival in Tonga called the Inasi, which was when pa- Paulaho, the chief we've already met, was going to install his son as a royal prince. Um, and that is the festival. As always, Cook was eager to find out what was going on, uh, but this time the, his desire to see what was happening was evidently uncontrollable. Rapacious, Nick Thomas calls it. And despite warnings uh, from the guards on the perimeter, he pushed his way through to the center of the event. And this is how he recalls it. I had resolved to peep no longer from behind the curtain, but to make one of the number of the ceremony. With this in view, I stole out of the plantation. I was several times desired to go away. And at last, when they found I would not stir, they, after some seaman consultation, desired I would bare my shoulders as they were. And with this, I complied. Williamson sourly observed, we who were on the outside were not a little surprised at seeing Captain Cook in the procession of the chiefs with his hair hanging loose and his body naked down to the waist. I do not pretend to dispute the propriety of Captain Cook's conduct, but I cannot help thinking he rather let himself down, let himself (laughs) down along with his hair. Um, But Cook would be here uh, or, or in one of these groups here. Sitting, um, um, sitting with um, the other chiefs cross-legged, he said, uh, in, a most, in the most humble posture with downcast eyes and hands locked together, demure as a maid, he says. So the concessions made in respect of dress and gesture have only one purpose, to get a clear view of the ritual and to gratis- gratify his curiosity. At first, Cook peeps through holes in, in cutting the fence, Then, being resolved to peep no longer, he makes his way to the middle of the area, but still he's not allowed the free use of his eyes, being forced to sit with them downcast. When he moves from there to get a clearer sight, he finds his view blocked by the masses of people. At all points in this strangely excited story of the Anasi, artifice, dressing up, acting a part, peeping from behind a curtain to witness an elaborate and mysterious display, is allegedly in the service of ethnographic eyewitnessing. But corresponding to the difficulty of keeping a clear sight line is the enigma of what is finally revealed. He says, we endeavoured in vain to find out the meaning, not only of the whole, but different parts of the ceremony. We seldom got any other answers to our inquiries than tabu. He reports various offerings uh, made of fruit and fish and vestiges of human sacrifice. I mean, the pole bearers uh, uh, seem to affect to be staggering with the weight of what they're carrying, as if it were either a pig or a human corpse. Um, um, but we, and, and there are some actual fish being carried at the end of the procession there, uh, real fish. Um, <coughs> But, uh, and with the exception of the fish, uh, everything else is, as Cook puts it himself, emblematic. When he's allowed the unrestricted use of his eyes, he finds that the poles and sticks with yams attached are not what they seemed. He said, after the assembly broke up, I went and examined them uh, and found these are these things here being carried. Um, after the ceremony, uh, assembly broke up, I went and examined them and found it. To the middle of each was tied two or three small sticks, as has been related. Yet we had been repeatedly told by those about us that they were young yams, insomuch that some of our gentlemen believed them rather than their own eyes, whereas it is clear we ought to have understood that they were only the representation of those roots. Now, his split judgment of this affair is typical of many he makes at this stage of his career. 
indicating that the duty of sober inquiry into facts is in conflict with the emotional and imaginative investment in the matter at hand. Cook always wants to arrange the products of imagination so that they will fit a factual report. At the same time, he's tempted to treat facts in a manner agreeable to the imagination. I mean, one of the most important remarks he ever makes, according to Beagleholm, certainly one of the most private, is actually in the first voyage, uh, where he says, he suddenly bursts out in his journey, he says, were it, were it not for the pleasure which naturally results to a man from being first discoverer, were it only of sands and shoals, this service would be insupportable. Insupportable. Um, and... The pleasure he's talking about is clearly visual pleasure, the pleasure of the eye. Um, in the case of the Anasi, um, this, 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 tendency, this, this tendency to indulge the imagination at the expense of, of factual reporting is very strong, so strong it causes him no surprise to find that the facts before his eyes are fictions. Bits of stick that stand for yams is starveling stands for moonshine in A Midsummer Night's Dream, or as Rachel's marlin spike stood for a baby in a high wind in Jamaica, or as the doll Cook gave to Porea stood for his wife. The small pieces of sticks, he says, that were tied to the others we were told were yams, so that probably they were to represent this root emblematically. This is how he wants to understand it, the representation of one thing for another. But the representation has no value as a sign, for he cannot understand what it means. So the pleasure gained from the sight of the yam stick must derive from its ambiguity. The yam that was formerly a stick, but is still a stick, iconic and aniconic at the same time. On the second day, he observes a number of small bundles or parcels made up of coconut leaves and tied with sticks made into the form of hand barrows. All the information I could get of them was that they were taboo. He wants to rebuke those who will not believe the evidence of their own eyes. But what can eyes report here in the Anasi but that things like wheelbarrows are not what they seem? What he pretended to do with poor air, mixing his imagination with the picta of his wife, he is now much more seriously engaged in, and it's a form of idolatry. And these are also called images, not for the resemblance of any corporeal thing, but for the resemblance of some fantastical inhabitants of the brain of the maker. It's with those fantastical inhabitants of the brain that Cook is identifying. There's no position from which to authenticate these things as, as these things or pictures, babies, let us say again, whose purposes and reference are all in doubt, but their attractive power and the pleasure that they excite are immediate. There's no hint that Cook is disappointed in the Anasi's inconclusive outcome. He says when it was all over, I now went and examined the several bas baskets which had been brought in, a thing I was not allowed to do before because everything was then taboo. But the ceremony being over, they became simply what they really were, namely empty baskets, so that whatever they were supposed to contain was, was emblematically represented, and so indeed was every other thing that they brought in except the fish. Whatever it was he wanted from the Anasi, he seems to have obtained. The discovery of something whose artificiality was calibrated to con considerable visual pleasure, a theatre of images or idols, um, of which he could give no account, a sort of bottomless dream. Bly observed the same state of mind in the Tahitians to whom he showed a doll made of a hairdresser's dummy. He says they were all delighted with it, even when they knew it was not real. The name Cook learns to give this delight is Tabu or Tapu. Uh, at his first landfall in Kealakekwa Bay, uh, Cook experienced the benefit of Tapu. Both his ships and the encampment on shore were protected by it and nothing was stolen. King reported, we enjoyed a tranquility about our dwelling that was the very reverse to the other places in these seas. But when the British packed up to leave, immunity ceased. The charm of tabooed ground was now broke, and they all rushed in, eagerly searching about the place in hopes of finding something. 
Nor was the tapu restored when they came back to the bay with a broken mast. Clark remarked on the difference. Ever since our arrival here upon this second visit, we have observed in the natives a stronger propensity to theft than we had reason to complain of during our former stay. Every day produced more numerous and more audacious depredations. At the point in his ethnographic career when he uh, understood the united pleasure and advantages of tapu, Cook arrived, not altogether consciously, I think, at a state of mind close to that of the Polynesians who formerly robbed his ships and were now robbing them again. That is, he was in the grip of what Anderson called an intense curiosity. Although he tried to disguise this pleasurable absorption as a quest for knowledge, strict inquiry was no longer what he was engaged in, any more than he was when he mapped sands and shoals off the Australian coast for an account no one but himself could find worthwhile or pleasurable. By the time he reached Hawaii and was hailed as Lono, he was aware that he and everything he possessed, all the property uh, of the ship as well as everything about his person, had been mixed with imagination and transformed into more than the sum of their material parts and were fit to be treated in a manner diametrically different from the objects that went missing in Tahiti on the first voyage. That is to say, they could not be owned as they were before. They were no longer accountable. They were idols, and like Rachel's babies or the emblems of the Anasi, they set in train events for which there was no adequate narrative model. Whether he was greeted as Lono, the incarnate divinity and antagonist of the war god Ku, or Lono Kamakahiki, the personificational idol representing the god, uh, a god doll, or Lono, or whether Cook actually appeared as Lono Ma'i Kanaka, a resurrected scion of, chief, of Lono's chiefly line, it cannot, it, nobody can say. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a, an issue on which much ink has been shed. But it's fair to say that the distance Cook was trying to lessen in the Anasi was entirely closed in the Makahiki. Uh, on Hawaii, the festival in honor of Lono that coincided with his arrival there. He was stripped, awarded the title and dignity of Orono, uh, and was introduced to the important gods of the Hikau Temple, the Hikiau Temple, one of whom he kissed. He was at the dead center of ritual power here, um, and at the last entry of his logbook. Anointed by the priest Keli Ekea, adored by hundreds of prostrate worshippers, protected by the chiefs and presented with huge offerings of food in the most sacred precincts of the bay. His conduct at these ceremonies of installation, as described by King, is a curious blend of the feminized and the mesmerized, the degree zero of absorption King reports Carr led him to different images and said something to each, but in a very ludicrous and slighting tone, except to the center image. To this he prostrated himself and afterwards kissed and desired the captain to do the same, who was quite passive and suffered Carr to do with him as he chose. In this nation of great idolaters, Cook is adored as a god and adores another in turn, an act of homage as blasphemous as his own assumption of divinity. Or, or so thought William Cooper, who put down Cook's apostasy and blasphemy as the reasons for his death. When the resolution returned to the bay and all those objects went missing, how did this assault on property figure in Cook's imagination now at the end? The person who formerly gave accounts to the king had stopped writing and begun being worshipped. All objects consequently were changed to things, endowed with the self-subsistent qualities of idols. Um, and if being Lono was the pinnacle of aesthetic pleasure, then all things from food to the ship's fittings contributed to that pleasure, just like the false yams and iconic and iconic baskets in the inner sea. These were Cook's babies, pictas, or idols, emptiness in its most voluptuous form and proof of his authorship. But when they were reconstituted as mere objects, nothing but what they really were, namely tongs, chisels, and caps, then they recalled to Cook 
all the turbulent difficulties of sorting out public, public accounts from private ones and inflamed his passions in a very painful way. And I think what happened in Cook's imagination was that there was a kind of iconoclastic explosion causing him to act in a manner that was, from the point of view of his people, not rational or personate. I mean, they call it infatuated. And from his own point of view, was not even properly authorial. It was certainly not personate. In the immediate wake of Cook's death, this state of affairs wore a face which no narrative could fully describe. King's Journal turns into, into Chinese boxes of supplementary accounts as the search for a satisfactory public narrative comes to an indeterminate close. Cook yields to Edgar, Edgar and Vancouver. Clark yields to Phillips. Then Rickman, Ledyard, Zimmerman and Ellis give their version. And Douglas's official version is contradicted by Samuel's memoir. Nobody seems capable of owning an event which William Ellis said could no more be foreseen than prevented and which Alexander Hume said was impossible to relate. And so it goes on in a savage series of replies and rejoinders between Salons and Obey Secretary and in the more temperate disagreements between Salmond and Thomas over the details of the death and the reasons for it. As for personal property, that came home to the minds of the failed narrators at Kealakekwa Bay in its most gruesome form. Locke says that our first property is our own body. And Cook's was distributed all over the place, a gruesome repetition of his own failure to deliver a full account. His head went to a chief called uh, Kekuhaipio, his legs and thighs and arms to Kalaniopuhu, and his hair to Kamehameha. They were all destined to become the focus of cults, babies of a potent kind. Cook ended up on the Polynesian side of the beach as a kind of uh ah breeding gods from his dead body. His hand, scalp, skull and thigh, sorry, hand, scalp, skull, thigh and arm bones went to the ship and thence to the ocean. Um, So James Cook, Commander D.D., discharged dead, and that part of the account was, was, was duly entered. But that's all, really, that one can be certain of. And that's it. In view of, I mean, I think it's a very powerful image you leave us with, of Cook redistributed Jews and the person of the island. But in that sense, exactly, I mean, do you think, uh, looking at the way in which you know, the figure of the cattle is so profitably sort of distributed in the European imagination, Mm-hmm. You know, is there a sort of you know a connection you think we can make there that helps us understand not Cook's death so much as the supposed acts of cannibalism that may have contributed to it, or mm. in some sense a representative of that distribution rather than an eating? Yeah. Um, well, um, on the on the second voyage, I mean, Forster was very interested in cannibalism, uh, and he said about Maori cannibalism insofar as it could be um, identified. Um, he, he said that, that, that it was a sign of great uh, energy, um, great passionate energy on the part of a culture um, that could feel that mere killing of someone was insufficient revenge, that had to be something more. And, uh, I mean, to that extent, I think that Forster was identifying a kind of passion that uh, was close cousin to imagination in the Māori. Uh, and um, to that extent, I think, would be saying that in the Polynesian, in the Polynesian mind, I mean, there were, uh, there, well, there, in the Polynesian uh, sensibility, there were passions and imaginations, which I would say Cook very strongly identifies with. Um, I mean, it, 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 neither Forster nor Cook uh, had any time, for example, for the, um, the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego, who were not cannibals, but were so incurious about everything that was put in front of them that they seemed to be you know, nothing but creatures of hebitude. And this they put at the lowest level. So the Māori, I mean, being so passionate, were kind of you know, well on the way up that hierarchy towards the Tahitians who uh, stood at the top.
except the Tahitians were not cannibals, so they were more civilized. But, I mean, Forster's point is that you get to civility by means of, 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 of a passionate nature. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Are you, are you going to do this, Jennifer? <laughs> sorry, yeah. Um, so I'm, I've recently been uh, reading in my comps in indigenous world history. And so recently was reading in the debate with Solomon from OES and Perry. And um, I, you know, I'm sort of on the side of, of with Solomon's, but yet I also think that I question whether or not we can assume that his own interpretations of some of the, you know, signs and mm -hmm. symbolic structures within the Maori Kanaka, you know, Hawaiian mm -hmm. uh, was correct. But I also, I've had the, the personal experience of working in a Native Hawaiian charter school, mm -hmm. and mostly I was learning from Maui, um, the Ohana, the, the family that was running this charter school. But one of the great activities that they did was this makahiki. Mm -hmm. And so we did that with the students. And um, I learned during that time that um, part of the um, context, if you will, was that uh, there was no violence. There was, there was a, a sort of like a representation of violence, mm -hmm. but that was a time when it, different warring sort of clans or you know, bands, what have you, uh, you know, Ahapua, you know, the valley systems, mm -hmm. would not embattle with each other. Right. Uh, they would engage in these sort of war games. Mm -hmm. But when that ended, it was back to, mm -hmm. you know, you could engage in violence. Right. Um, but I'm wondering, I guess my question is this. I'm, I'm sure that there must be some Hawaiian scholars that are actually Hawaiian that have something to say about that. I mean, about about, about about sort of like you know what you know what we can say about interpretations and their mm -hmm. views on this particular narrative. Sure. I I, I mean I I, I say I, I think it's you know it's an area where people can't really agree. I mean. Um, I mean, one of the things they can't agree about is, is how Cook was greeted. Was he greeted as a god? I mean, which is the sort of, you know, uh, one of the central points of Bayesegre's critique of silence was that that, that, this, that that misidentification couldn't possibly have occurred. Um, you know, so there's a possibility that Cook was being um, greeted as somehow an idol. I mean, um, something, you know, that stood for a god, um, or that he was, um, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was actually being put into a, 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 um, a, a dynasty that claimed to derive from Lono, so an actual dynasty, but, you know. So I, I, I think it's very hard to say, I mean, how he, even he was fitting into the Makahiki, and a lot of people say that Silence's data is too exact, it's too symmetrical, that in fact the Makahiki worked in a, in a much more um, well, that it, it certainly wasn't necessarily uh, working to the same kinds of rhythms and, and, and periods as he suggests. Yeah. Uh, but it does seem to be the case that, 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 that under Lono is a period of peace and fertility and that under the war god Ku there is killing and that um, Lono is dispatched and sent offshore again in, in, in that kind of mock ship thing. Uh, and and, and that, that Cook did seem to run out of luck at that point. Um, and it does seem to me from the accounts that, that what was being played out there was some kind of um, very, very subtle political battle between the priests and the chiefs. And the priests had, had collared, um, collared uh, Cook and thought that they could make something out of this uh, and were probably very depressed to see him return. Because whatever they had made out of it, they'd made, and now it was just loss. Um, but the, but, the, but the, the point I'm trying to uh, make in this talk is, is that, is that it, it's at that point that you see that, Cook, that Cook's relationship to property is so badly skewed that have to, to have to come back and face the issue of lost naval property is something that, that kind of ruptures uh, uh, his imagination. I mean, it, it, it's too much for him because he has committed himself to this absorption in visual pleasure, uh, you know, uh, uh, to a degree where he can't retrieve himself. Yeah.
your, your argument is about his own sort of subjective transformation, you know, in terms of property to um, to authorship. That's right, as you said. But it's interesting because even within this own Ohana, I mean, these brothers that I talked to that I was learning from that were teachers in the school, they didn't have the same view on the same story. You know, they yeah. they have different views, and so right. it's, it's interesting. But thank you for that. I just wanted to follow up on um, the issue of property, and I'm just curious about, and I don't know very much about this part of the world because I'm Latin American, so it may just be coming from a place of ignorance, but um, it seems like Captain Cook is, is obsessed with the property and this notion that people steal, right? And so I guess I'm wondering what Captain Cook was stealing and you know what his voyages were stealing and how that fit all together. Um, it's, maybe it's just kind of a more constant question, but it, I think it relates somehow to his understanding of what was happening. He couldn't see the differences and different ways of understanding property. Um, I, it's true. I mean, he was he was he was laying claim to possession of places, but I mean, under um, under international law, I mean, it was a very peculiar kind of claim to, to to possession. I mean, it was called inchoate possession, in fact, because if you were going to claim possession of somewhere that was already occupied and settled and you weren't going to settle it yourself by treaty or by war, then, I mean, you couldn't really make a credible claim for possession at all. Well, at least uh, Emmerich Wattel said you couldn't. Um, so I think that, I think Cook, Cook, I don't think Cook worried about that. I mean, he was an hydrographer uh, who, who, you know, did the coasts. He mapped, you know, very good at, at doing lunar observations, so he could map New Zealand without a longitude. Uh, um, I, I, think he, I think he did his job. I mean, I think that was what he was doing. He was doing his job um, until, un well, in the first voyage, I think he was doing his job, but what he stole, if you like, was not, was, was, was not anything belonging to anybody else. I think what he stole was visual pleasure. <laughs> I think he stole, he stole even hydrographical pleasure, I think, for himself. Uh, I think he mapped things that gave him pleasure to map because no European had seen them before. And even if they were reefs off the Australian coast that were covered at high water, he mapped them. And he actually tries to explain that to himself. But I mean, probably one of the most dramatic explanations is, is, is when he sails from uh, New Zealand uh, across uh, uh, to, to Cape Horn. Uh, on the second voyage, on that second great sweep to the Antarctic. And he can't bear the privation of, 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 of visual stimuli. He can't bear it. Um, he keeps talking about it. And he keeps talking about the first things that he sees when they come out of the, uh, out of the ice wastes. I mean, and, and says, you know, we saw seaweed, but we couldn't trust it. We, we saw penguins, but there, there were no signs of land. They were not telling us anything at all. You know, it's, so I, I, I think all the time in his voyages, there were, there were things that pleased him and pleased him personally. And those he did steal, as it were. <laughs> Until finally, that visual pleasure uh, just becomes too much for him and he commits himself entirely to it. I mean, I, I, if the, the, the weakness, I think, in, in Glyn Williams' account is if Douglas was supposed to edit something about the Makahiki Festival, I mean, what could be more um, outrageous than Cook's own account of the Anasi? Um, you know, where he goes sort of whole hog after, um, after a good sight line. He wants to be able to see. He wants to be able to see and to sort of glut his, his sight on what he sees. I mean, it's, it is a most voluptuous kind of account. Well, it's not an account. Sorry, are you saying then that the voyages weren't collecting anything? Well, they were collecting things, but always this causes Cook problems. Um, I mean, he wanted to collect facts. I mean, so he collects hydrographical facts. Uh, the men start collecting curiosities, and this causes Cook all sorts of 
difficulties because he says, well, curiosities aren't facts. And also the collection of curiosities means that actually buying food uh, and other supplies in the, in the, um, at their landfalls becomes more tricky because the curiosity trade drives up prices for everything. Uh, but it's clear that he is interested in curiosities and would like to be able to tabulate them and keep them. Um, um, or he has some kind of instinct for tabulating them. He'd like curiosities to be treat, treated as facts. Uh, and this, I think, is all symptom of a kind of, a kind of split in his sensibility between trying to order things you know, into an account that the Admiralty will accept and, on the other hand, being distracted by these, these, these other things, these, these aesthetic sidelines that, um, that he knows he can't put into an account and which, I mean, I think disturb his whole notion of what property is. Yeah, I guess I want to follow up on both of these questions a bit because I, um, I'm struggling a bit with the idea that, that the, the, the most important theft or collection to talk about here is in fact visual pleasure um, because it seems to me to lose sight of the larger project that Cook is in fact emblematic of, or whatever, whatever phrase you want to use, which is the project of empire. And I, I, I'm trying to understand where that... Well, I think in the third, in the third voyage, I mean, it's, it's on this coast that he loses that. Um, well, higher up. On the well, I guess what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that maybe he doesn't lose that, but he may lose that, but it doesn't get lost, right? Because what we, we know what comes next, right? Yeah. And, and so there's a, and I wondered also too in these stories of contact that I, I think this was a story of contact. Um, and this may be a question for all of us as scholars. To what extent does the other side of contact even matter? And I was really struck in particular by the discussion of uh-uh, which we had talked about briefly before, and um, that the only voices of regarding uh-uh were an anthropologist and a poet who mm -hmm. called it a toad. And, and I'm, I'm wondering, to what extent is that sufficient? Oh, it's not. Oh, it's not. I thought, I thought, I thought more, 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 more would be said about AHA uh -huh, tonight. I mean, I'd like to hear. I mean, I, I can't say. I mean, I, I can speculate. I mean, I think, I think it, I mean, I think it, um, I, I think it's the most remarkable image. But uh, I, uh, Jell is, you know, um, a, a, an anthropologist for whom I have a lot of respect, so I cite him. But I'm not an anthropologist. Um, uh, f f the, the, the culture that, that produced AHA, I, I know nothing about. Um, I know slightly more, perhaps, about, about Tahiti, but not much. I know more about Maori material, but even then, not much. Um, but I, it, um, I, I don't want to make Cook into a, a kind of, um, I mean, not for this purpose. I mean, it would simply cloud the issue. I mean, I don't want to see him as an agent of imperialism from this point of view, because it seems to me that what he's, what he's doing uh, as he loses sight of property as he becomes more and more attached to visual pleasure for its own sake, not, not for any other reason, um, is, 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 um, is profoundly subversive of the mission that he was on. Uh, I mean, if one wants to find Cook, you know, as a more friendly presence on the margin of the South Seas, I mean, it's, it's here, it's here at the Inasi that one will find it. At the same time, I mean, his, his, his interest in local customs can be calibrated directly uh, with his cruelty to local people who take things. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not as if he ever, you know, he ever becomes unambiguous. But, I mean, I think it is interesting that he... Um, I think it's interesting that he goes through this metamorphosis. Um, what he was like before he went through that, I think, is... is, is um, is a question we could debate, uh, and, and one would want to debate that at length and put it in the context of the people who edited his journals and the people he sailed with, like Forster and Banks. But um, I, 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 if I've not conveyed a sense of, of how remarkable his transformation is in the third voyage in particular, then I've failed. Okay, we're going to take two more questions and then make questions. 
you know, I mean, uh, listening to your talk and also listening to your responses to some of these questions, I mean, I kind of got a sense that little by little, you know, uh, James Cook was transforming himself into Bauskinski playing a gear. And uh, with the exception, of course, of the fact that uh, uh, a lot of what is important about a gear is the soundtrack. It's all the sounds of the jungle and so on and so forth, which helps out sticks in there. And of course, uh, we can't rule out the fact that um, though we're always prejudiced in favor of the visual, uh, some of the pleasure that Cook may have found uh, might have been, and I don't know, actually, I've never having read his materials that closely, uh, whether they were auditory, I don't know, but perhaps they were olfactory. Um, yes, we can't rule that out. Uh, which is always a big, big problem with historians of encounters, that is to say, what is, mm -hmm. how, how we factor the other senses and mm -hmm. besides the visual one. That's true, that's yeah. true. Uh, but I was actually wondering in some sense, you know, to sort of come back to the question that was, that was, that was asked to you, which is, which is, you know, really, I mean, finally, we've been going around this a little bit in different sorts of ways. I mean, and it goes back to, you know, Garanath's whole big uh, problem with, 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 with martial silence. Uh, which is, all right, so we don't have a kind of <coughs> symmetric situation in terms of sources or anything of this kind. So on what basis does one speak for something else than Cook's own perspective, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, I mean, you know, Salon's made fun of, uh, of basically saying, you know, because you come from an island, you think you can speak for somebody else who comes from an island, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, Chicago is on the border of a lake or something. <laughs> so that, 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 yeah, but but I mean, but in, in, a, in a certain sense, I mean, what we are, you know, dealing with finally is the problem that which is insuperable. That in a whole number of situations, we are going to come up with uh, asymmetric uh, production of materials regarding an encounter. Yeah. And nothing to be done about that, that blunt fact. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, where, where do we go and where do we actually throw up our hands and mm -hmm. say, at this moment, nothing more can be said. I mean, you know, there were two books that were produced in the 1960s called La, La Vision de los Vencidos and La Vision de Vancou, mm -hmm. both of which turned out to be basically reading Spanish materials against the grain and claiming that they were the vision of the vanquished. So uh, is there some moment in which we actually have to say, look, uh, you know, this is as far as we can get, really, because there is nothing more that we can say and probably nothing more than anybody else can say. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there we are. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, um, um, I mean, I started the talk by saying that I was interested in the reasons for a threadbare theme, always, always attracting new versions of the narrative. And I think <coughs> what I hoped to show was that, that the narrative content of that has disappeared. I mean, there is, you can't tell the story, at least you can't tell the story from, uh, from, from the Admiralty side, at least. Um, this, the, the story may have some kind of may have some kind of meaning. I mean, there may be a mystery that can be disclosed, but I, I, I don't know what it is other than what I've said and what I've talked about has been visual pleasure taken in in things, not objects, but things which I mean represent nothing, represent nothing distinct. So I mean, for me, aha is um, is is it's 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 the the, the kind of perfect visual tautology of aha, which seems to me to be expressive of that kind of, uh, that kind of, um, well, that kind of embarrassment of um, a, a Western narrative enterprise. I mean, there is, there is nothing more to say, really, um, except that Cook's imagination was possibly electrified and then, you know, uh, uh, intensely, intensely embarrassed. <laughs> Sorry. And then electrocuted. Well, something, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Certainly a, a great, um, a great event in his imagination. Does Cook stay alive? <laughs> <laughs>
if he chooses to hold to his notion of property. Um. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a it's a buoyant conjecture, but uh, I mean, I think um, I don't think he had that option. Why not? Um, because if he could have, if he could have, he would have. I mean, he was he was he was he was he was. Well, you know, I quoted what his what his response was to his to his his admiralty orders. I mean, he says. I'm a plain man. I'm a ma man of matter of fact. You know, I say, I say it how I see it, and I, you know, I say it simply without any ornamentation. I have no imagination. Is what he says. Um, but you know, he doesn't. That's, that's not how he was constituted, and it's not how events played out. So uh, you know, he he was he was caught up. I mean, and and one of the turning points, I think. I mean, I think there are lots of little turning points before, but I mean. The Anasia is the big turning point, I think. Now, it, I mean, people always concentrate on the Makahiki, but I mean, the Anasia was, the, was, was, was when he gave up. He gave up. He gave up not just on property. He gave up on the cognate of property, which is propriety. Um, and to think of somebody like Cook, I mean, so, you know, apparently staid and, um, and, and hard-bitten <laughs> in the service. I mean, taking his clothes off. And letting his hair down is, is um, That's where it goes down, yeah, after that, <laughs> <laughs> Williamson was right. Yeah. All right, before I thank you, we're very thoughtful. I want to remind us that we're reconvening tomorrow morning at 9 30 across the way uh, in the Museum of Anthropology. I think Neil has some. Yeah, there's also going to be for those of who, those who are in the There is also going to be for those of you who don't have breakfast in their places of sleeping. Uh, the, <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long day. Uh, breakfast will be at the Museum of Anthropology at, as of 8.30, if I'm not mistaken. And how do they arrive at the place where breakfast the place will be? Is <laughs> okay, so show up, show up at the entrance between 8.30 and 9.30. You will be treated to a spectacular view as well as reasonable food. <laughs> well, thank you all.